What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to the channel. So in my video series looking at shooting time and hyperlapse videos, I decided that I wanted to take a look at how to use the open source media processing tool FFmpeg as a free, essentially, way to go about converting your time-lapse photo sequences into actual videos. Now, I had originally included this video as a whole in that time-lapse video on FFmpeg simply because, it, to me, it made sense there. However, in retrospect, that made that video way too long. So I've decided to break it into two parts. In this part, we are going to talk about, or in this video, I should say, we are going to talk about how to install FFmpeg specifically on Mac OS and Windows, and how the basic command line structure, command structure for it works. Now, if you want to see how to use FFmpeg to make a time-lapse video from a series of still images, check out the other one. I have a link in the description and a card to it. So with that said, let's dig into installing FFmpeg on your computer. So before we can use FFmpeg, we have to install it. Now, if you're a Linux user, the odds are that it's already installed on your system. And if not, you're using Linux. So you probably know how to install it from your distro's package manager. So I'm not going to talk about that a lot. If you're a Mac user, then things are only slightly more complicated. Now, the easiest way I've found to get FFmpeg on Mac OS is through the Homebrew Package Manager. So we'll start by installing that. Now, one requirement for this is to have the Xcode command line tools. So start by this, if you don't already have that installed, is to install them. To do this, we're gonna open up the terminal app and simply type Xcode-select space dash dash install. Uh, then just follow the prompts for that to install. When that's done, open your browser of choice and then head to brew.sh. Now, right under the big install homebrew line is a dark box with some code in it. Next to that is a little clipboard icon. Click that and it will copy that line of command or that command into your clipboard. Then go back to the terminal window, paste it there and hit enter. Now, if that doesn't work, there is also a package installer linked on brew.sh that you can download and run and to install like any normal package. While the installer is running, it'll take a little bit of while or a little bit of time. We'll ask you to enter your password to get elevated command privileges. Do that, let it finish. And once it's done, then we need to install FFmpeg itself. Now to do that in the same command or the same terminal window, simply type brew install FFmpeg and hit return. Homebrew will then go about downloading the FFmpeg binaries and setting it up so that we can actually use it. Once it's done with that and back to the command prompt, just type FFmpeg minus version on the command line to see that FFmpeg is actually installed and working. Finally, if you're on Windows, getting FFmpeg is usable is arguably the most complicated of all of the platforms. And it does require a couple of extra tools, specifically 7-zip from 7-zip.org. And optionally, if you want to make this a little easier for yourself, the Microsoft Terminal app and Windows Power Toys, both of which you can find in the Windows Store, both of which are created by Microsoft. Now, I chose to download the executables from one of the links on ffmpeg.org. So that's how I'm going to walk through the setup process here. So again, in a browser of your choice, head over to ffmpeg.org. Then click on the big green download button. Mouse over the Windows logo and you will get the choice to download from two different servers. I chose Gaian.dev, so click that. Now on the next page that loads, which is Gaian.dev's site, you'll want to scroll down to the section that's labeled release builds and then download the file that's labeled ffmpeg-release-full.7z. Now, once that's downloaded, you can extract that archive and quite honestly, you could stop here. There is uh, an ffmpeg.exe file in the bin directory in that folder that you just extracted, and that is all you really need. However, to run this from the command line anywhere else, you are going to have to type out the whole path to that downloaded folder. 
And that's pretty messy to type every time you want to use this. So we'll want to put this somewhere and add it to our path so that we can just type ffmpeg on the command line instead. Now to add this to my path, I renamed that extracted folder to just ffmpeg and then moved it into the c colon backslash program files folder on my hard drive. Then is simply a process, the process is simply to add it to my path. Now there's a number of ways to do this, but the easiest way is to fire up the environment variable editor that's part of Microsoft's Power Toys. Expand the user section, find the path entry in that list, and then click the little three dots button, then select edit from the menu that pops up. Now in the window that pops up, you will have a list of a whole bunch of paths. You don't want to change any of these. Instead, what you want to do is scroll down to the bottom. There you will find an empty line. Click on it and you're going to type in C colon backslash program files backslash FFmpeg backslash bin, where we put the binaries that we just downloaded. Now click save and the path will be updated. We can then close the window and we should now be able to access FFmpeg from the terminal anywhere on our computer. We can try this by bringing up the terminal and typing FFmpeg dash version. And again, you should get a message that looks like this from FFmpeg telling you what version was installed. Now with FFmpeg installed, we need to get into actually using it. And FFmpeg is an incredibly complex program. However, if you break the commands down a little, it's really not insurmountable to understand what's going on. So each command is broken down into three major parts. There is an input section, an optional filter or processing section, and an output section. Now the input section is where you tell FFmpeg what files or files it uh, file or files it should read and what it needs to know about them like perhaps the frame rate. The filter or processing section tells FFmpeg how to manipulate the data beyond just recompressing it. So possibly altering the color or doing some resizing or something like that. Finally, the output section tells FFmpeg how to compress the results and what that file should be called. Now, hopefully this in the big picture is understandable enough. So you might see a command that looks something like this. This breaks down like this. First, we have the program we're running, FFmpeg. That always is going to start the command in our process. Next, we have the input parameters. In this case, that's minus i movie.mpeg4. The minus i followed by the file name tells FFmpeg what file to read, minus i for input. Now, the middle part would be for filtering. However, in this case, we're not doing any filtering, so there isn't anything in the filtering part. Now, the final part is the output operations and file. In this case, there are four options. The first is minus PIX format, YUV422P10LE. This tells FFmpeg to convert the input file to 10-bit YUV color data with 422 chroma subsampling. So it doesn't matter what it comes in as, that's what it's going out as. Second is the video or codec video ProRes toolbox. This tells FFmpeg that uh, what video codec we should use to compress the output file. In this case, I'm going to use the hardware ProRes encoder that's in my MacBook Pro's M1 Max CPU. The third command is minus profile colon V2. This controls which profile pro or which ProRes profile FFmpeg will use. In this case, two tells the converter that it should convert this file into a Pro ProRes 422 option. And we'll cover this option in more detail in a second, specifically for ProRes. Finally, there's the file name that everything should be written to, in this case, output.mov. Now this brings me to what's easily the most powerful aspect of FFmpeg, the absolute plethora of codecs that we can read and write with. Put simply, it can deal with just about anything. But to keep this manageable in this video, I'm going to look at just four specific implementations, two of ProRes and two of HEVC. Now, if you're a Mac user and have an M1 Pro uh, 
Max or Ultra or newer Apple CPU, then you can use the hardware HEVC and codec and uh, ProRes encoders. They're called in FFmpeg HEVC underscore video toolbox, that's for the HEVC option, and ProRes underscore video toolbox for the ProRes option. Now, if you're using an older Mac that doesn't have these encoders, Windows or Linux, then we're going to use the built-in or the FFmpeg native ProRes codec for doing ProRes compression and LibX265 for HEVC compression. Now, FFmpeg actually does support hardware encoding from AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA. And you could easily substitute that for the software processor, at least HEVC, uh, process that we're talking about. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to just stick to the above two in Windows. Now, to tell which of, uh, to tell FFmpeg which of these codecs you want it to use, you use the minus codec colon V command followed by the codec name. So for example, minus codec colon V space ProRes underscore video toolbox or minus codec colon V space libx265. Next comes the quality standard. FF, uh, and this is a little bit more complicated because quality is defined differently for ProRes and x265. Now the ProRes standard defines specific target bit rates based on what profile you're using. And this is handled automatically as long as you specify the profile. Now the profiles are proxy LT422, HQ4444, and 4444XQ. Now in FFmpeg, these are specified using the minus profile colon V command followed by a number from zero to five, with zero being proxy, four being LT, two being 422, and so on. Now, typically, when I use ProRes, I either use LT or 422 for my workflow and going to YouTube. So I would be profiles one or two in the worst case scenario. Now, for HEVC, the easiest way to manage quality is to use a constant rate factor or the constant rate factor mode. This means that the software will figure out how many bits to use for each frame. So more detailed frames will get more bits and less detailed frames will get less bits and it will work out so that things look as good as they possibly can. Now to specify this, you use the minus CRF argument followed by a number between zero and 51. Lower numbers produce higher quality, but larger files. Well, at least that's the rule in general. Apple decided to go a different direction. So in their HEVC video toolbox implementation, this is reversed with 100 being the highest quality and decreasing values towards zero, resulting in lower quality, but smaller files. Now, what CRF should you use? Well, if you Google this, you'll find a lot of people talking about using values in the 18 to 20 range. However, most of the people that are talking about this aren't working as a video processing or video production with intermediate or master level files for video for that use. Typically, I use CRF values between 12 and 18, usually 14 or 16 on my non-Macs and around 70 or 80 on my Mac when using the hardware encoder. Uh, again, we just, in the production side of things, bigger files aren't as much of a problem as bad quality. Now that said, if you are using HEVC files and you find them to be too big, feel free to adjust the CRF values, but make the changes in small increments, say one or two at a time and retest. Now, of course, this is just the very basics. For more detail, your best bet is to hit up Google or search for exactly what it is tr you're trying to do. Uh, you can also drop a comment below and I, or perhaps, perhaps some of the other people who watch this channel may also be able to help you. Okay, so I'll be the first to admit that was far from a complete guide. And that's certainly not the only way to go about installing it or using it. That said, I do hope you found this useful or at least interesting, especially if you were going to go into using it in the time-lapse application that I talked about at the start. If you did, let me know by hitting that like button or sharing this. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And 
If you'd like to directly support this video or content like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can, or buying yourself something you've always wanted from one of the affiliate links in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.